What is up guys, Coach Show here at the Lion's Den with this creature. We're not really sure if he's human, if he's not human. Kind of looks like my thumb, but, oh, like, yeah. a, but like a way bigger thumb. Uh, Dr. Mike, and the, the rumor on the street is we have beef and we're here to tell you that we do have beef. I don't like him. I... Uh, anyway, he's been helping me out with my training and my nutrition. Reluctantly. Uh, <laughs> We're just going to be answering a lot of your questions that you guys had asked uh, when I put up a picture of my current physique update, which I'll put right here and just kind of go along with the flow and Dr. Mike will give you his input on that. But right now, currently, I'm about 15 pounds down from when I had started. Um, this whole process was probably, I want to say like two months, but it was six weeks of way more intense training that was focused on hypertrophy and weight loss. Um, but we've known each other since about February. We've been training, getting to know each other. I'm answering questions about your physique. Yes. All what the, if, all the, the ins are and the outs. <laughs> Some of the questions are like, hey, can you take your shirt off more? And we're like, that's not really a... Okay. <laughs> yes, he can. This is the Lion's Den casting couch. Mm. But um, let's talk about the plan. Like just from the, the basic outlook of it, I had come to Dr. Mike and basically where I was as a straw man is I was a 242 competitor in USS and in NAS I had to be uh, 232. My goal was to compete in the Arnold, uh, but we had basically come to conclusion that it would probably be better off for me to um, stick with USS and compete in that organization where I will actually lose weight, get to the lowest body fat possible, and then slowly add mass and fill out the 242 class as a heavyweight for USS when I do get back to competing in strongman. There's a lot of other stuff that was involved with that, but that's just the gist of it, just to catch you up to speed with things. Uh, but when I was telling you that, Mike, what were your thoughts kind of going through your head as me as a strength sport athlete, you know, where you wanted to take me, a kind of a plan you had started formulating yeah. in your mind, what was going through your mind? Yeah, it's a really good question. You know, so um, to, uh, for me, I've coached enough folks over the years to know that it's a it's a really uh, give and take process, mostly because I, you don't ever want to dictate to an athlete what they should be doing. Yeah, I'm Dr. Mike, whatever bullshit, but like some people want to go a different way and there's also no correct way. There's a correct way to do what you choose, but you also always have multiple choices. Like if you were like, hey, I want to stay lighter, but be super lean and fast, I wouldn't be like, you're an idiot. I'd be like, that's a cool way to go, you mm -hmm. know? like. Lots of strongmen do really well staying on the lighter side and mm. moving fast. And then there's the, you know, the big Z road of just getting enormous, which also has clearly its own mm. merits. So I first, my first thing was just to talk to you about how you felt about things. And then you were really open book. So you were like, yeah, like I could go either way. And then you sort of hinted at the fact that you were like, I feel like I could get bigger, which fed into my biases about your physique. Cause we had been training for a couple of weeks already. And I was like, how old are you? What's your training experience? And I had gotten the idea that I was like, dude, this guy can put on gallons onto his frame, like pounds and pounds of muscle. And so I was hoping you'd be like, I want to get more Jack. Then you were like, I want to get more Jack. And I was like, thank God. <laughs> so then we looked at your physique and we're like, okay, you know, I'm at this point in my career, I don't really even coach, right? You just, this is like a pet project, a science mm. project. Yeah, yeah. Um, but like, I'm very uninterested in doing short-term things. Mm -hmm. Like if folks that I'm gonna be working with, I'm interested in working with long-term kind mm -hmm. of folks as far as like people who have a vision for their physique or their performance that extends like more than 12 weeks from now. Like, yeah. so the first thing I asked you was like, so how big do you wanna get? And you were like, you know, yeah. How big <laughs> do you think I can get? And I was like, huge. And you're like, right, hey, sweet. Yeah. So with that long-term view in mind, I was like, let's get, you were like, you know, of a pretty decent body fat percentage, very athletic, but I was like, Let's clean the slate. Let's get the body fat down to like the 10% or a little under range and then use that as a base to go from there and slowly add quality muscle over months and months and months mm -hmm. later. So that's how I came to the idea that we're going to do a 12 week fat loss phase in order to get you down and then start to build you back up. And during this 12 week phase, we're going to introduce some hypertrophy training methods. Those are the methods that you're going to keep for the next multiple months after. It's a great time to learn them during fat loss and they pr preserve all the muscle. To be honest, and like you mentioned in other talks we've done, these are so novel to you and you hadn't done high volumes in so long that you're building muscle and losing fat at the same time mm -hmm. at a really rapid rate. We just want to keep that muscle building rate the same as you gain weight and then you're going to get super jacked. So 
that was my view. At first, I wanted to know which way you wanted to go. Mm -hmm. And then once you said, yeah, like I'm getting bigger seems like the best idea. I was like, say no more fam. And then we set up. And also I, I got to tell you this, like real talk, one of the reasons why I have you do a fat loss phase first is I could have easily just been like, let's just start gaining weight. Um, one is health because like getting leaner first makes you super healthy mm. and then not ever getting super fat on a mass is good. Yeah. But another one is honestly, man, like I've been, um, I've sort of like, uh, coached sort of on the down low, some people here and there over the years, especially as I've gotten to be more reputable over whatever Facebook fame. Um, and I'm like super uninterested in coaching people that aren't dedicated because mm -hmm. you and I have just a friend relationship. Yeah, like yeah. I don't, you know, like we're just doing this because I think we're both on the same page of seriousness. Mm -hmm. And the fat loss diet is to honestly, to some extent, and this sounds super fucked up, like a bit of a test mm. to see if you really wanted to do some shit, right? Yeah. Cause like, even if I told you, Hey, what do you think fat loss? And if you were like, uh, I don't like, get the fuck out of my face. I wouldn't have say that cause you're bigger <laughs> than me and would hurt me. But like, you know what I mean? It was kind of yeah, like yeah. a, Hey, like if you can take this fat loss face to the teeth, lose this weight, increase your strength just a little bit, then that shows me that you're a, cause like, if you got a strong man doing a fat loss phase, you know that motherfucker's after something. Yeah, yeah. Because everyone can just get more jacked and eat more food and gain more weight. And maybe they'll fizzle after a couple of weeks, but because you committed to the phase and you're rocking it right now, I know that you're gonna do everything. Because once you do a fat loss phase, a muscle gain phase is yeah, fucking easy. Easier. And then you're way off to gaining tons of mass and all this other stuff. So to be honest, lately, if I work with folks on very rare occasions, I'll usually just cut them the real deal right away mm. and be like, if you'd like to have my input, you're going to do things that are a little bit difficult, not a difference of your total plan. I'm not like, look, if you're not interested in being the world's best, get away. Yeah. I'm just like, let's put the hard stuff to, if you survive, we're gonna be fucking golden. But if you don't, great, then you and I can work as short term as possible. So I'm, yeah, yeah, yeah. You. I'm sure you've been, you, uh, you, you coach way more than I do. Have you had promising athletes before that were like, hey, can we do stuff together? And you sort of write them a plan and then they fizzle out and you're like, fuck, like you feel like. Yeah, I would say. Um, not that I thought you were gonna do that, but I didn't know you from Adam, you know? No, 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 for sure. And uh, as a coach, I've gotten actually more away from coaching people for that exact reason. Like now I, I'm very selective on the people I wanna work for. And it's funny because I do that uh, with my clients, but I think I do it more in a programming style mm -hmm. where I'm like, listen, if you can't, you know, hang with this program and actually put the work in and, and dedicate the time. All these goals you tell me you want to be the best of this, it's never going to happen. Yep. Um, so that's just funny. But I feel like, yeah, I feel like it was the Matrix where it was like, he's Morpheus, the red pill, the blue pill. He's like, do you <laughs> take do you, both yeah, of these motherfuckers? Yeah, 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 I was going to say, do you want to get big? Do you want to? And I'm like, just, yeah, swallow, like whatever. <laughs> um, but let's, a lot of people had questions about um, training and nutrition. And let's just, like, I'm just going to start pulling them out. We're going to answer sure. them. Um, but one of the main questions people kept asking was, how are we incorporating straw man into hypertrophy? Is it necessary at this time you think? And if it was, how are we doing it? What's the balance between straw man training and hypertrophy training at this point um, of us working together? It's super simple. We only do strong man movements, but for high reps. So axle clean cleaner press for sets of 20, <laughs> five by 20. <laughs> do you think favorite. anyone could survive that? Uh Dude. Five by 20 continental axle clean and press. It would take me a lot to do that event in a competition if I read it. You could pop your stomach open doing that. Like your you're, stomach yeah, organs. Yeah, your intestines are just <laughs> like, spewing out. You're dying and there's nothing we can do for you. So that's a really good question actually. So strongman moves have a very poor stimulus to fatigue ratio for hypertrophy. Like, and the hilarious thing is, is you never have to talk strongman into that because they already know that yeah. because they train hard. A lot of times people will ask me when they are used to only hypertrophy training or very easy machine training, they'll say shit like, can I do more strongman in my workouts? And I'm like, you don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. So you were super easy to convince. I was like, okay, let's really pare back on the strongman stuff, do more hypertrophy training. So honestly, the honest answer is Joey does one, sometimes two days a week of some light event work. And the purpose of that is to conserve the technique and the speed and the transitions, which he already has. He's a pro strongman at a very high level. Conserving it is way, way easier than what it takes to build it. And now that he's building muscle, that's on the front burner and the strongman is way in the back burner. So two days a week, sometimes one day a week, 
of just light event work, usually just to make sure we're getting the feel of all the stuff. Also, you're in a fat loss phase, so it kind of acts as a little bit of cardio, but that's really all we're doing, because here's the deal. If you take a strongman who's really good at the technical events and you just baseline the technical events for months and months and months while he gets either leaner or bigger and stronger, when you start threading the events back in, you have so much more to use them, you skyrocket. Mm -hmm. But if you always do the events, you can tell me better than I could tell you, there's a plateau that happens where like you kind of know how to load stones and you just don't have a big enough back like Zadrunas Viscus. Yeah. That's the only thing keeping you back. Like as far as I know, a lot of the top strongman too, they don't always train events all the damn time. And I think people, because they see the competitions because strongman training is really fun, they think it's all going to be events all the time. Events, there's a time and a place for. Can you expand on that? Uh, once again, I think you nailed it. Uh, I think for me, this whole thing came at a good time mentally, which I think is something that's not talked about enough in training and getting your uh, identity so wrapped up in the type of lifts you are. So switching over to hypertrophy actually just mentally was great where I enjoy training. And for any athlete who's super serious, I think they're lying to you if they're telling you it's, that it's always sunshine and rainbows. I feel like at some point you're gonna hit that wall and that's where you have to make adjustments. And if you don't, you get burnout or you just don't wanna do it anymore. So switching it up for me was super necessary as well as like Mike was saying, for me to get the lifts that I needed to increase uh, doing this hypertrophy phase and working on certain muscle groups is the only way it's gonna happen. Just like he said, I've been loading stones for years now. I don't think that it's gonna get more complex when I come back to it. So as soon as I start training again, it's gonna kind of come right back but doing you know, one to two days a week of some light technique work keeps that ingrained in the system um, with me being able to focus on the hypertrophy aspects of my training so that when I get back in, I'm going to come back even bigger, even stronger, and kind of just pick up pace right where it was left off. So um, yeah, in terms of the training, I've been doing it um, mainly just one day a week. Other days I use uh, other stuff has some conditioning modalities like sandbag runs or farmer carries, etc. Um, but I, I know that when I start again, it's, it's going to be picked up right away. So uh, a lot of people are asking is what's our split looking like right now? Uh, what's the, and the, the frequency of our lifts per uh, muscle group? And did you have any thoughts going into the plan, you know, that we put together uh, that I've been following you with? Like, wh what's that looking like? Yeah. So I mean, it's a very conservative plan. It's a six time a week training and it's uh, essentially like push, pull legs or push legs, pull the order of those doesn't matter so much. So uh, for the chest and back or the main pushing muscles and main pulling muscles, they're trained twice a week, uh, legs are trained twice a week. And then things like shoulders and traps and forearms, uh, biceps, they're trained probably like three or four times a week, peppered into those upper body days. Mm -hmm. So it's a modified push-pull leg split. Not a big fan of like the idea of splits. You train muscles hard and then they recover and you train them again. If you don't train them very hard at any one time, if you train them a little bit every one time, you can train them more frequently. If you train them really hard at one time, you can train them less. And there's a big middle ground where all those approaches are very, very effective. Because Joey's a big, strong guy, and because he's come from a background of probably a little bit lower frequency training with strongman and powerlifting, I knew that I wasn't gonna start at a super high, crazy frequency. So I started at two X a week for the large body uh, muscle groups, and like three to four X for the smaller ones, and that seems to be something you took to right away, and it's a very conservative start, and also the amount of training per session was very low when we started, so we know we weren't overdoing it. Uh and someone else had also asked, which I think kind of goes hand in hand with this, is talking about recovery. Uh, now I'll ask you this question because I never really have gotten your answer and this will be the first time I could probably guess we're gonna go with this, but do you incorporate recovery methods such as stretching, yoga, sauna? Uh, and if so, do you think it's important uh, to add during this training split? Yeah, the answer to that is no. Um, so stretching does not enhance recovery in any way we can measure unless it is stretching in a setting of which relaxes you. If you do yoga and it relaxes you and it's not very physically strenuous, it can help recovery, but so can sitting on the couch watching Netflix because that's also relaxing. The sauna, if it's relaxing for you and if it's very enjoyable for short periods, can enhance recovery. 
But if you sit in the sauna, how many of you share, you vote vote by clicking on your keyboard and no one's listening? Uh, how many of you hate heat exposure and just the sauna is miserable? If you answer yes, it's not a right or wrong answer, don't go in the sauna because you're going to actually add fatigue. And remember, folks, heat stress is a real type of stress. Mm -hmm. It's additive. Some people in some cultures really like the sauna. They really relax and that helps them recover a ton. Russians, people in Finland, the Nordic countries, I'm one of those people. For some reason, I never got the sauna message. Like, it's fun for me for about five minutes and then I hate it. <laughs> but like my training partner, Charlie, or our training partner, Charlie, he anytime he overheats beyond like one degree, he starts to have a panic attack. And anytime he sees his own sweat, it's like someone seeing their own blood, he's gonna pass out. So like if I put him in the sauna, it would like decrease his recovery by 500% or something. So to be honest, and there's actually some, some new research has come out adding to a body of research on cold exposure after training markedly reduces hypertrophy from training. And people thought that was a recovery modality. Now, to be honest, cold exposure actually does enhance recovery, how soon you're ready to train again, but at the expense of adaptation, mm. which is really messed up. But like, if you have a multi-day strongman meet, doing cold exposure after every one of those days is great because you'll never get super sore and tight. But if you're trying to train hard to gain muscle, do not do cold exposure. Yeah. Honestly, folks, and this is as no BS as I can make it, recovery, help, recovery strategies, the biggest ones, sleep enough, eat enough, and don't have a ton of emotional stress in your life. If you do those three right, you don't need anything else. And a lot of that other stuff, stretching, yoga, it really comes down to does it relax you psychologically? And if it does, it's great. But if it doesn't, don't do it. Some people even think cardio is a recovery modality. Like, do you feel more recovered after you're on the treadmill for 50 minutes? People are like, no, I feel like shit. They're like, well, that's not recovering you. Exactly. Yeah, uh, I literally have. No, I don't do my recovery. It comes from eating and training properly with good programming, um, as well as everything he had said, sleep. That That's my recovery game. I would also just say kind of, umbrelling what, what Mike had just said is if you like something that makes you feel good, do it. Like that's cool because you have the psychological effect of it feels good and you enjoy it and it's relaxing you. Um, but no, I don't do any stretching, no sauna, no yoga, any of that. And I think a lot of people neglect just proper programming to help them sure. recover properly. Um, and that should be something that should be looked in a little bit deeper instead of going right to those other training modalities that were mentioned in the question. What's interesting, I'll get asked pretty often like, what do you do for joint pain? I'm like, I don't have joint pain. They're like, what do you mean? Like, it's only at the end of a mesocycle when we're pushing it super, Training super really hard. hard yeah. And I know how to modify exercises to make sure it's not cumulative. And like, if you have chronic joint pain all the time from lifting, you need to re-examine your technique or your volumes or your loads or something. It's not mm -hmm. something you're just supposed to, especially in hypertrophy training. In strongman, in powerlifting, weightlifting, sometimes just part of the sport. Mm -hmm. But like, if you're doing hypertrophy training and you're like, my knees always hurt, like that's an issue you gotta handle that no amount of saunaing is gonna do anything for. No, t totally agree. Um, in terms of fat loss, a question that uh, was asked was, am I doing any cardio to do this? Now, where do you kind of side on, uh, should cardio always be included when trying to lose weight or should it come more for, uh, or come from nutrition aspects, a little bit of both? Or like, what are your thoughts on that and yeah. cardio? And then for me personally, did you think I need to be doing cardio uh, throughout the week during this fat loss phase or no? There's actually a very good, easy, universal answer for should I be doing cardio. You look forward to the next week of your diet and you realize that your rate of weight loss or fat loss is going to be insufficient to continue to meet your goals. So you know next week you're going to have to create more of a calorie deficit. Mm -hmm. You have to then ask the next question. Okay, I have to create a deficit. What is going to fatigue me more? Doing a bit more cardio or more activity of any kind, and even if you start at zero, or eating less food. So for example, let's say you have a physical job. Let's say you're a construction manager or a construction worker, or you run your own gym and you're running around. Who knows how many steps a day you get and who knows how hard you're working. You're sweating all day long. And because you're a larger person and you're doing a fat loss diet, you're still eating like 500 grams of carbs a day and you're losing a pound a week. And now it's a little less than a pound and you gotta lose a pound, so you gotta change something. Are you really gonna still eat 500 grams of carbs a day? Cause you're like, you're barely eat at work, you're stuffed all the time, you like, can't mm. believe I'm losing weight being stuffed. Are you really going to make the adjustment of more cardio? You'd have to be nuts. You're already doing a ton of cardio mm. more or less then you would reduce the food. Now, on the other hand, let's say you work as a computer programmer or a website developer, 
90 some percent of the time you're sitting down. And when you go home because you have no friends, you're back at the Xbox yelling at teenagers on your headset. Die, motherfucker. You know, with the video that's, games. That's me. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I was like, I know your website. You don't want to point me out. But... So if you are very, very low activity level, you're already not eating a ton of food. You look forward to next week and you're like, okay, I'd have to cut 50 grams of carbs. And you're like, that's going to make me really hungry. Mm -hmm. That's going to make me very irritable. And it's going to make me more fatigued, like psychologically, if anything. And then you ask yourself, okay, what if I just took a 30 minute walk every day? It would accomplish the same deficit, but like it would actually make me feel better and like less fatigued because I would be outside. It'd be nice. Then the answer is 30 minute walk and don't cut your food, right? So at every stage of a cutting process, there's an algorithm that like next cut needs to be made, which will be less fatiguing, eating less food or mm -hmm. doing more cardio. And you kind of choose and there's no right answer categorically. It's based on how you're doing. And at some point, look, both of them will suck. You just pick the less sucky one. Mm -hmm. Like if you're already walking like 50, like I have a step tracker on right now, I'm at 12,000 steps every day. That's my goal for this fat loss phase. If you told me I had to do 15,000, I'd be like, that's okay, but it's pushing it. If you told me, look, you either need to cut your food, you have to do 20,000 steps, I'd be like, cut my food, man. I, <laughs> I'm going to walk my legs off my yeah. body. But if I was, you know, in a different situation where I was doing 5,000 steps a day and I was eating very little food, I'd be like, dude, I'll gladly do 10,000 for no food cutting at all. So it really just comes down to that decision. And for Joey, he's a pretty active guy and it's his first fat loss phase in a long time and he's eating plenty of food. So we're just doing exclusively food cuts and the volume of his training and the fact that he has a dog, he walks his dog, he, he's up, up and about all the time doing stuff. He's not the kind of guy that there really needs to be doing cardio because he's fundamentally cardio is just added caloric expenditure on the activity side. He's already very physically active and he's eating plenty of healthy food. So we're cutting food exclusively because we don't need to add cardio. Mm -hmm. And if he was trying to do a bodybuilding competition or something like that, of course, at some point that algorithm would say, okay, maybe we should do more activity and not at least not eat less. Food. Yeah. I'm a big fan of just trying to keep the, the client or athlete as compliant as possible. Uh, so just like Mike had said, that that's the kind of the, what you look at their lifestyle and what's going to keep them with the, the best rate of progress as possible. Um, now with the training and doing a cut, is there any training that needs to, or the, does the training need to be modified or changed at all when you are trying to lose weight or does it just stay the same and, and that's it? You got to think of yourself as lighter every rep you do. Cause if you think the fat away, the chi. Right? Namaste. That's what we were monks. Um, good question. As long as you're above your maintenance volume on a cut, which is roughly the same as your minimum effective volume on a maintenance phase, as long as you're doing enough training volume and your frequency is more than like, it's two times per week per muscle group or more, two to four times a week usually, you're good to go. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, for more advanced folks, sometimes you want to pick exercises that are a bit more high on the stimulus and low on the fatigue side because you're not going to be as fatigue tolerant. And probably the biggest change you're going to make is the volume jumps you make week to week and the loading jumps and the repetition jumps if you're making those are just going to be a little bit more conservative. You got to just keep the muscle on, keep the performance good, keep it better than it was before or the same. Don't worry about making these crazy PRs because sometimes you can design your training to go for nuts PRs. That's not the time to do it on the fat loss phase. The time is to sort of maintain your strength and maybe improve it just a little bit. So if, for example, if you usually, and this will become very obvious because you accumulate more fatigue on a cut, so you won't be able to do this, but trying and not being able to is some shit you and I have done a ton before. Like, yeah. I'm going to put 10 pounds on the bar and that doesn't work. No, like, yeah. shit. <laughs> so like, for example, if you usually put 10 pounds on the bar every week for a leg press, put five more pounds on the bar and then you'll have this amazing successful cycle where you go sets of 20 to start and then sets of 20 to finish six weeks later, you lost no repetitions. You actually gained 25 pounds on the bar. If you tried over that time to put 50 pounds on the bar, your reps would start to fall off. You get super crazy fatigue. You'd have to deload earlier. Everything goes to hell. So because you're not going to be as capable of adapting, just instead of like your volume and, and, and loading being pointed this way, just point it this way. We're not saying point it flat. We're not saying point it down. Just a little less high of an incline so that you can get some breathing room and actually accomplish all of the week successfully. Well, that was a lot of information. And uh, a lot of you guys asked nutritional questions, which we answered on a video on the RP's channel. So I will link it right up here. You guys can check out any of those questions about my nutrition, my diet, using the RP Diet app, which I've been using throughout this entire process, and I'll give you a lot more insight on that. Spoiler alert, I like it, use it, 
check it out. It's pretty good, but make your own conclusions. That's fine. Um, but dude, thank you so much for coming on the channel, answering some questions. I still hate you, but I kind of like you, but not really at all. Uh, his hands getting a little close to my thigh, it's making me feel pretty weird. And uh, on that note, um, I got to get out of here, folks. So stay lean, mean strength machine. Make sure you head over to RP's channel, subscribe, follow him on the Instagram, put everything down below in the subscription, but giving you guys a little intake on the training and the nutrition. Peace. Boom.